Pastor Davis Balcombe. Dennis Balcombe received Jesus Christ as his personal savior in 1961. Also received the call of God on his life at a young age and traveled to China at the age of 24. He has lived in Hong Kong for the past 47 years. God has greatly used him to bless, the, bless and strengthen the Chinese church, a church that now has well over 100 million believers. He speaks fluent Mandarin and Cantonese. He continues to minister to the Chinese and many others throughout Asia, Asia and the world. As the founder of Revival Chinese Ministries International, he is a sought after speaker globally. Dennis lives with his wife, Kathy, in Hong Kong. They have two children, Sharon and Michael, and two grandchildren. Amen. I really love that name, Revival Chinese Ministry International. Tonight we have Reverend Dennis Bal Balcom with us tonight. Please stand to your feet and receive him as he'll come to minister the word of God unto us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Greetings in his wonderful name. We're in the house of the Lord and we're going to have a great evening in worship, prayer, and hearing the word of the Lord. You may be seated. My subject, if you can put on the PowerPoint this evening, is the word of God and missions. I'm a missionary. I love to talk about missions. Missions is different from mission. That little S makes a huge difference. A mission may be the goal of your church or your life or a company like Apple Computer. I'm using probably had a mission statement to put an Apple Computer into every family in whatever nation. But missions means going to another culture, another group, another ethnic group and bringing the gospel. So if you can briefly just put up the PowerPoint there. This is my subject, it's the Word of God and missions, praise the Lord. Now, I'm going to be talking about Africa. I'm going to Africa next week because I'm the chairman of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Hong Kong, not in Africa, but I go to Nigeria quite often and I want to tell you about one man whose vision impacted countless millions of people. His name is Pastor Enoch Adaboya, my very good friend. Now, Adaboya was a Christian from a youth and he joined the Redeemed Christian Church of God in 1973. He began the work to translate the sermons of the founder, I'm not sure I pronounce these Nigerian names correctly, but it's Pastor Reverend Josiah Olufemi Akadaya Yomi. And he, of course, in that part of around Lagos, they speak in Yorubu. So he translated this into English because he's excellent in English. He majored in mathematics in university. His English is very good. And this Pastor Joshua started a church. It was originally called the Cherubim and Seraphim Church. But he thought there was some strange things, maybe a little bit too extreme. Nice people, but not everything was biblical. So he started the church in 1952. And from a few dozen people, it grew to about a thousand people at his death, which was in 1980. Pastor Adaboya was ordained in this church in 1977. And he became the general overseer in 1981, one year after the death of uh, Reverend Josiah. Because God put this in the, it was a vision from God. The Lord actually gave him a vision when the founder would pass away. And within a year, he took over the church. And God gave him a vision, a heavenly vision to expand the work of the ministry, to preach the gospel, to save the lost, to preach throughout this great nation of Nigeria and throughout Africa, in fact, all the world. When he took over the church, it had a thousand members. 
But through the vision God has given him, now they have about 3,000 members. Now, this church wasn't well known before Pastor Adaboya took it over. But now they have branch churches in 196 nations and more than 14,000 churches in Nigeria. Isn't that amazing? Everywhere you go, you see a branch of this church. They have them in Hong Kong, in China, in the Philippines, throughout Asia, Indonesia, around the world, England, United States. Now. One of his goals is to put a church within five minutes walking distance in developed country cities and five minutes driving distance in developing cities. So if you have to walk more than five minutes to get to a branch church and you have maybe 10 believers, he'll start a branch church. If you're in a city like here where we can drive, if it takes more than a five minute drive, then he'll start a branch church. It's a great vision that God has given him. Now we actually in which he means he gave money to four Nigerian universities. One was the uh, Obafemi Alolowo University. Another was the University of Nigeria. Think a minister supporting the universities of the nation. Of course, they do a lot more relief work. I could not even begin to tell all that they've done to bless people. And Newsweek magazine in 2008 said that he was one of the 50th most powerful people in the world. I mean, there's a lot of people in the world. To be in the number one of the 50th people is really amazing. So he, because in Nigeria they will not allow a director of an organization, a chair to be in that position for more than 20 years. So he's resigned from the director of Nigeria, but he is still the general overseer of the redeemed Christian Church of God globally. Now let me just spend a minute or two and talk about the mission of this church. You know, your church needs to have a mission. We're talking about turning point. What are we going to turn to? What are we going to do differently? What is our mission? What is our vision? What is our goal? How are we going to do it? You see, this is very important. First, it's very interesting that every member of the church will make it to heaven. Now that's important because I believe in preaching the gospel for 56 years. There's a lot of people sitting in the churches around the world that will not make it to heaven. Because a lot have not even been born again. They have only heard a social gospel, not the true gospel. They've never repent or they have one time been born again, but they went back in the ways of the world. So they won't make it to heaven. So it's important. I hope that everybody in my church, we have about 1,500 people. I hope that every single one will make it to heaven. That's what my goal is for my church. I want everyone, when they leave this earth, to stand before God and to enter the pearly gates and to worship with the angels. Hallelujah. <laughs> Secondly, he says to do that, Every member will live a holy life and not compromise with the world. Now, in Africa, a lot of you maybe have ancestors in Africa. That just doesn't mean not to commit adultery, not to do immoral things, not to get drunk, not to take drugs, not to beat up your wife, you know, not to smoke or curse. It means more than that. Don't compromise with the religious spirit in Africa. There is what we call syncretism, where you mix Christianity with other religions like the Church of Zion in South Africa. Huge, hundreds of thousands of people. But they mix native African religion with the Pentecostal message. They're praising the Lord and worshiping God and so-called speaking in tongues. Then they'll bring out a chicken and cut off the head of the chicken and offer the blood right in the church to whatever God they're worshiping. It's called syncretism. So in Africa you must be a true Christian. Don't mix in with witchcraft and all of these other things. Hallelujah. Live a holy life. Thirdly, that every member will be active in evangelism and soul winning. Everyone is a soul winner. Everyone is a missionary in a way. Everyone is a preacher. You may not be called a reverend, a bishop, an apostle, but you are a missionary. You are making disciples. Everyone should be involved in that. And that's why the church grows. Then, like I said, when they have a group of converts that have to walk more than five minutes from the nearest RCCG uh, church, when people have to walk, they will start a branch church. If it's nations where they drive, after more than five minutes, you have ten people, you start a branch church. Now, if you go to Lagos, Nigeria, I've been to Lagos before. 
Almost every street, you will see the sign of RCCG. Just every street, everywhere. It's really amazing. They really are successful in church planting. When any, a new person visits the Sunday service, they get the name of the people. And almost every time that day, they will visit them. If you come in the morning, some pastor or some worker is going to come and knock on your door. And he's going to say, thank you for coming to our church. How can we help you? Do you need some help? Our church, maybe you have AIDS and you need to be prayed for or referred to an AIDS clinic. Maybe uh, you're looking for a job. We have an employment agency with the, uh, with the church. Uh, maybe you need housing. Well, let us think about how we can help you with housing. Maybe you just want someone to talk to. And these people, when they come in the morning, that very day or the next day, someone comes to visit them. They say, these people really care about me. And they will go back to that church. You should think of that. It's amazing. Because I'm the chairman. I know uh, Ataboya quite well. And so he told me these are one of the things they do. Okay, I have a scripture here. I'll just read this to you. It's in 1 John 2. It says, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you in his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. I'm talking about healthy families in revival. I'm talking about healthy families that were reproduced. Now here we have... It's a church family, of course, but we also have our own families. We have children whose sins have been forgiven. We have fathers that knew him from the beginning. We have young people that have overcome the wicked one. And again, we have children because they've known the father. This is the kind of a church we want to have. The next scripture in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. I told you yesterday I love the Bible. I've been preaching for 56 years and I love the Bible. I've read the Bible hundreds of times. I read it several times every year. I learned Chinese, Cantonese, and Mandarin by the Bible. That was my textbook. Every day I listen to it on my, you know, cell phone. You have recording. So I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures because we need to hear the word of God. So in Ephesians 6 it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. That's the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. And bring them up in the training and admon admonition of the Lord. Now I want to uh, put on the first video about the meetings in Nigeria. Because I've seen this in Nigeria. I've seen this in Ataboya's ministry. In the redeemed Christian church of God. I've seen strong, strong families. The children are there. The babies are there. The young people are there. Oh, the children, the older people are there worshiping God. I've seen a man with a vision to build a strong church built on strong families. So if you'd put on that video, this is taken in Nigeria a couple years ago. And Sai 
signs and wonders and miracles following. That's the television screen. They have and I want 50 you to know that prayer works and prayer will change this. The first missionaries went to China in AD 700. And this is another one of the choirs. Over a thousand people in this choir. There's so many people, the building can't take all of them. Many are outside, thousands are outside. some of the leaders praying. Prayer is the key to the revival in Nigeria, throughout Africa. If nobody lay hands on you, you can lay hands on yourself. <laughs> some of the congregation outside. Hundreds of thousands of people. In this particular meeting, there is no less than half a million people. This church is three kilometers long. If you use miles, it's about 1.8 miles. And you can walk from the front to the back. It takes 40 minutes just to reach the back. Every time you go, you will see many, many miracles. I go about every other year. You'll see hundreds of cripples get up and walk. You'll see blind eyes being opened. You'll see cancers disappearing as people pray. Because you have 500,000 spirit-filled Christians that are praying in faith. You have men of God with the gifts of healing that are laying hands on people. And you will see miracle after miracle. I have many videos, no time to show some older, some going back to 1998, before they had this building. At that time, there was literally millions of people in the meeting that went on day and night. There were so many people, pregnant women came and gave birth to their children in the meeting. There were 30 people, 30 children born right in this meeting. Praise the Lord. Right during the worship. What a great time to give birth to a baby in a time of worship and prayer. And we saw so many miracles. This is because a man had a vision. A man had a revelation. A man had faith. A man believed the full gospel. And he communicated that to other people. And they communicated that to other people and they begin to build up a church based on strong healthy families holiness is number one the fear of the Lord you got to make it to heaven you got to set free stay free from sin you got to preach the gospel this is outside though the building is the biggest building in the world for churches not everybody can get in so thousands and thousands of people are outside worshiping the Lord hallelujah thank God for what he's doing around the world especially in Nigeria a nation that I love and I go there and I want to see this revival spread throughout Nigeria into all of the continent of April praise the Lord and so God is doing a wonderful thing in this nation okay uh, praise the Lord uh, okay just put up the sound on that just listen they're fishing the meeting right now this is the end it's about three o'clock in the morning along the meeting store. They don't go home at midnight. They stay till 3 or 4 o'clock. These are some of the people came to the front to rejoice before the Lord. They're happy because they know Jesus. They're happy because they're spirit filled. They're happy because they have the Holy Ghost in them. Hallelujah. 
see all the young children. They said they're all night long. Meetings go for several days. Once again, this is the longest church in the world. Dr. Yonggi Cho probably has the biggest church as far as numbers, but this is their camp meeting. It's the, in the Redemption Camp Center outside of Logos. And every year they have a meeting. Please go there, December. They will love you to go. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we need to have families. I have another scripture I want to share about the importance of the Word of God. I began yesterday, but you know, so much you can't do everything. And I actually scared the scripture last night, if you're here. When Jesus was tempted of the devil, he answered from using the Word of God as in the uh, Old Testament, uh, what God said through Moses, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's both the written word of God as well as what God is saying to us today because God is still speaking through his spirit but we have many people that twist the scripture the next scripture I'm going to read is in 2nd Peter 3 16 so Peter is talking about Paul he says in his epistles in Paul's epistles speaking of them of these things about doctrinal things in which are some hard things to understand. They don't understand them. You read the book of Hebrews and some other scriptures that may not be easy to understand. Which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they also do the rest of the scriptures. They twist the word of God. There's so many people that twist the word of God. They don't really preach what God is saying in his word. They have a doctrine, a thought, a philosophy and they try to find scriptures to justify it. Instead of letting the word of God speak as it is, they need to read and to teach the Bible in the context. I have an example in Singapore. The biggest church of 32,000 people is pastored by a man named Joseph Prince. Now usually we don't want to speak about other ministers in public. But this is a case where we must speak out. I speak out all the time. Because he's preaching extremely dangerous doctrine that is sending people to hell. It's called hyper grace. It's just grace. Hyper grace means that only one time in your life do you say a sinner's prayer. And God's grace comes to you. And all your past, present, and future sins are forgiven. He doesn't believe the Holy Spirit convicts anybody of sin. He says the Holy Spirit will never convict you of sin. Because God wants you to know about the grace of God. And he doesn't believe that 1 John 1, 9, which says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, is written for Christians. He says it's for non-Christians. Christians never have to repent of their sins, he says. Well, here's a scripture very important. Proverbs 22, 20, it says, don't remove the ancient landmarks which your fathers have set. I don't care what angel comes and gives you what revelation, what man gives you a prophecy. I don't care if you went to heaven and you saw Jesus personally. If your teaching is not in the Bible, if it's not a foundation of truth, it's not of God. It's not of God. It must be one of the ancient landmarks in the Bible. Before we were Pentecostal, we were evangelical. Before we spoke in tongues, we were fundamental. We believe the inspired word of God. We believe in the Trinity, the divinity of Jesus Christ. We believe that people must repent of their sins. We believe in sanctification. We believe in holiness. We believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. We believe in heaven and hell. We believe in judgment. We believe in God's righteousness. Yes, we believe in mercy. But not the kind of mercy they're talking about. Not the time of grace they're talking about. We believe in the biblical co-teaching of grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to show this by the Bible. This heresy was in the church a long time ago. It's mentioned in the book of Jude, a very short book, but very powerful. See, Jude said, I was diligent to write unto you concerning our common salvation. He wanted to write an epistle, a letter about salvation, about doctrine, about various things. But all of a sudden, he said, I found it necessary to write to you about one thing. Exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all the saints. You must contend for that faith because the devil's coming in and stealing it from us. We have bishops and pastors 
pastors and prophets and apostles that are not preaching the old time religion, are not preaching what the Bible taught, not preaching evangelical teaching. And he says, you have to contend for that faith. Fight for that faith. Stand up and preach it. And if people preach otherwise, you can go to them and we've gone to this man, but he will not listen. No pastor can talk to this man because he says, who are you? My church is the biggest church in the city. I have all these people. Forget about you people. Well, it's a very proud man that says that. And the Bible says that pride goes before destruction. And this is, you can't talk to this man. He doesn't want to listen. So we're contending for the faith. Now, what is he talking about? It's very evident in the next verse, in verse four, he said, certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They crept in. He was just one of many preachers in Singapore. But he began to preach this message and people didn't realize at first, hey, well, maybe he just emphasized more about grace. And the people love it. Sinners can come to the church and they can be accepted. If you're in a church, say you're an elder, and you've committed adultery and had an affair, so the pastor comes and said, this is wrong. You must repent. You must sit down for one year and receive counseling. You know what that elder will do? He'll go to his church. It's called New Creation Church. He'll say, Pastor Prince, you know, I was in this other church, but I want to join your church. He said, why did you leave? Well, they disciplined me for adultery. Oh, no problem. The grace of God is so great. I don't care what you did. God loves you. You can be an elder in my church. Exactly that happens. It's unbelievable. They turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord Jesus. Amen. There's a man called David Pawson. He's an excellent Bible teacher. If you just get on the YouTube, David Pawson, he has some of the most excellent teachers in UK and England, but his English is very easy to understand. And he's teaching about the truth. Now, he has studied the original languages. Now, Joseph Prince said, I heard him two weeks ago in Hong Kong, you should never memorize the Ten Commandments because they're not inspired by God. They should not be in the Word of God. We don't have to keep the commandments now. But he said, you should memorize John 3, 16, because that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, because it begins, God so loved the world. But if you look in the original, Greek, it actually said, in the same way, this is Jesus talking about Moses in the wilderness, when the people murmured, they put a brazen serpent up on a pole. And all the people that looked on that, they were healed of the snake bite. So in the same way, the Son of God shall be lifted up. It's not talking about our worship. He's lifted up on the cross and he's going to draw on men unto him. That's the biblical interpretation. In the same way, God the Father acted in love on another occasion. God so loved the world. Now we know we say God loves people, but actually the Bible says the wrath of God is upon the sinners. God hates not only sin, but he hates sinners. But he did something so wonderful to solve the sin problem for all people in all generations throughout eternity in that he gave his only son to die for everybody. You see, love, I love you. Well, if you see a beggar on the street, you say, I love you. Well, what does it mean? But if I gave him money, if I help him to solve his problem, it means I really love him. So just saying I love you doesn't mean anything. But God loved us so much, he did an amazing thing to solve our problem once and forever. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and on this occasion, he gave his only begotten son when Jesus died for the whole rebellious human race. So by sacrificing his own natural son, that should be a natural son, not begotten, because Jesus wasn't born. He's always been God from the very beginning. You see, I mean, he was born as a man. The word became flesh, but he's always been God. So people say, there's a Jehovah's Son. He's the begotten son of, of God. So 
He was born. Yes, the physical man, Jesus, was born. But that was the word became flesh. But he always existed. He's the natural son of God. So that all that go on trusting and obeying him might never be ruined beyond recovery, but go on having everlasting and abundant life. Now, that's what the Greek says. Now, the word believe in him in English, in Greek it means continue, present, tense. You have to continue believing on him. Yesterday you believe. Today you believe. Tomorrow you believe. Maybe next week there's going to be persecution or temptation but you say, I'm going to believe. I'm going to hold on to the end. I'm not going to give up on my faith. I'm going to serve the Lord. You have to continue to believe. And if you do that all your life, the day you die you will be in heaven. Amen. But if you stop believing, you refuse to obey his word. You refuse to call upon the Lord. And eventually sin comes in and you can see by people's actions they're not really believing then these people are going to perish this is so important next God I have here of scripture it's a very interesting one it says Romans 16 17 I urge you brethren note those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them and you can see the picture here this man at the left you know him, know him he's called Herbert Armstrong he started a church called the Worldwide Church of God the pictures are from his magazine called the plain truth when I first believed in Jesus and I was a nominal Christian if you get my book but at 16 I really was born again and when I believed in Jesus I turned on the radio and heard him preach there's no hell God is merciful when the Bible says those that don't believe will perish he says it's just like a piece of paper being burned up they will not be around we call it annihilationism a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses believe in that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes in that sinners will be annihilated and I thought that makes sense they can't go to heaven but they won't have to suffer why would a loving God make people suffer well I was going to go to my pastor and say, hey, you're wrong. You're preaching. If you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. But I was a little bit wise. I said, well, man, I haven't read the Bible. I better read the Bible first to really see if this doctrine is right. So I read the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. That's before I had computers and all these electronic gadgets. I just got A4 paper, uh, maybe letter size in America, and I got a pen, and I wrote down all the scriptures that talked about hell, about judgment, about punishment. I had 10 pages on both sides. I was shocked. Hell is real. There's worms, but they never die. There's smoke that goes up. There's wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's fire. The devil is there. It's a terrible place, and it's forever and ever. And people that don't believe in Jesus, well, go to hell. I saw it in the Bible. I said, this man is a false prophet. I'll never read his stuff. I'll never listen to him again. The Bible saved me. If I had not read the Bible, I would be in a cult today. And a lot of people go into cults because they don't read the Bible. And the preachers don't preach the Bible. They preach stories. What happened to me yesterday when I went to the market? Oh, God is so good. Oh, he led me. And you can be blessed because God has a great plan for your life. That's wonderful. But what about the Bible? What about you must be born again? You must repent. You must be baptized in water. You must be filled with the Holy Ghost. You must speak in tongues. You must preach the gospel. They don't preach the Bible today. They just preach their own religion. Well, the Bible says to avoid those people. My next scripture, which you know very well, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's proper for doctrine. For what? Reproof. For what? Correction. For what? Instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's not just for us to get the scriptures that bless us. He giveth you power to prosper. That's wonderful. Bless the Lord all my soul and forget all his benefits. That's wonderful. But there's a lot in the Bible that will correct us because our hearts are evil and wicked above all. And we need to be corrected from the word of God, from the preaching. We need to hear that we're going the wrong way. Repent, turn around or else you will perish. Hallelujah. This is what the word of God teaches us. Let me talk about China very briefly. I only have a few minutes. Uh, when I was young, much of 
The world was under communism. You can see all of Eastern Europe, all of the Soviet Union, all of China, parts of Vietnam and Korea, but people prayed and God was moving. 1991, communism collapsed in the Soviet Union. Eastern Europe was free from communism and China opened up. Now we can see there's only five communist nations, China, Cuba, Laos, Vietnam, and Korea. With the exception of Korea, I'm talking about North Korea, you can go to these nations. There are Christians. People are preaching the Bible, the, the, the Word of God. They're smuggling Bibles. You know, God has done an amazing work. So there's a scripture in Revelation chapter 3. It's to the church of brotherly love, the church of Philadelphia. I know your church is a church of brotherly love. I mean, I've received so much love here. You blessed me in the few days I've been here, and I see you how you have fellowships and pastors and branches all over the world, and you love other people. And Jesus says to this church, he that has the key of David, which is what? Worship and praise. David is a man after God's own heart. He opens and no one shuts, shuts and no man's open. He said, I know your works. I've set before you an open door and no man shall shut it. Hallelujah. This is the time of the open door. Let me tell you a little bit about China. This is Chinese. I'll read it for you. It means God loves the Chinese people. You know, God revealed himself in ancient China. You see the characters. You can preach the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Everything that happened from the Chinese language because those people knew God. They left the Tower of Babel. They went to China to worship the true God. Had not, They didn't want to have anything to do with Nimrod and Babylonian. So they went to China. God chose the Chinese people. They have always had some knowledge of a true God. You know, there's 7,102 languages in the world. Now, how are we going to evangelize the world? Well, there's only 23 languages that are spoken by more than 50 million people. So if anybody's smart enough to learn 23 languages, it wouldn't be easy, but people could do that. I speak several languages. People speak 10, 20 languages in, in Europe. Well, you could preach to 4.1 billion people, but only 335 million people speak English. Now, here we see the Chinese is spoken to another tongue by 1.2 billion people. English is used by only 335 million people as the mother tongue. But altogether, people understand English in the world about 1.5 billion people. Like in Nigeria and in India, a lot of people speak English. Well, God has blessed the Chinese. This is our language. It's actually characters. And you can see on the left-hand side was the picture. Like the fourth one down is a horse. And then on the right-hand side, you can see how we ride a horse today. Our one, two, three, four, five is a fish. You can see it looks like a fish. And the right hand side is how we ride fish today. Or you see the one that looks like a circle with a line. That used to be called the sun. And uh, you can see how we ride a tei, which is actually in the term for Japan. So it's not hard to learn the language because they're all pictures. And this is a wonderful language. Now let me just tell you quickly about the history of, of the mission in China. There was no Protestant missionary in China before 1807. Quite sad. Now, he was called Robert Morrison, sent out by the London Missionary Society. For a few years, he's buried in Macau. Go there, you'll see his cemetery, that of his wife, of his child. In fact, in the Macau Cemetery, most of the graves are of missionaries that went to China. Very few lived older than 35 years. Some made it to 40 years. Almost no one made it to 50 years. They went there to give their life for the Chinese to die that they might have the gospel. What sacrifice, praise the Lord. Now, before that time, there was no version of the Bible at all. And thought, people thought, the Bible's impossible to understand and to read. No one could ever read the Bible. But, and another man that was working with him, he said, to acquire the Chinese language is a work for men with bodies of brass, lungs of steel, heads of oak, hands of string steel, eyes of eagles, the hearts of the apostles, memories of angels, and the lives of Methuselah. In other words, no one can learn the Chinese language. Rubbish. He learned it in seven months. I learned it in seven months. It's not hard. With God, all things are possible. And then he translated the Bible. And you know what this missionary that said no one could learn the language wrote? 
This is, took 18 years. He said, by God's help, you've set foot what all the people of China can never destroy or effectively stop. What will raise their temples, destroy their idols, change their lives, and save the souls of many. And now we see over 100 million Christians in China because someone translated the word of God and other people preach the word of God. Hallelujah. These are some of the missionaries. You've heard of Hudson Taylor and these other people. I'm not going to take the time to go into this, but all of their ministry had to do with the Bible, translating the Bible, preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible because of the Bible and good theological teaching, good evangelical teaching. On top of that, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the 20th century. We now have a hundred million Christians. All glory be to God. Hallelujah. You know, many missionaries were martyred in 1900. 45,000 Christians and 266 Western missionaries had their heads cut off. But more missionaries went back to China. There's been a total of 250,000 missionaries and Chinese Christians and preachers that have been martyred for the Christian faith. But we say the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yes, we've had more martyrs in China than any nation. Many of my friends have been killed. I've been in prison. Many have been in prison. Today, many are still in prison. But persecution only causes the church to grow. When you're martyred, more people will rise up and preach the gospel. And now we have the largest church in the whole world because people are dedicated to preach the true gospel. Hallelujah. Thousands of messengers came from the West. Much misunderstanding, much hostility, much hardship. Why did they do this? This is a missionary that's in the stockade. She's going to have her head cut off after this picture is taken. The three Chinese at the bottom, they're going to have their head cut off. This is the 20th century. These are some of the Roman Catholics, literally thousands and thousands of missionaries and Catholic believers that were martyred. These are some of the Christians in the 19th century. Literally thousands of them died for the sake of Jesus Christ. These are pastors, men of God, but they gave their life for the gospel. Whole families, their heads were cut off. Look at this family on the left. These children, three children and their parents in one day with other thousands of people, their heads were cut off. Why did they do this? These two people in the middle are our workers. We sent them to pack stand last year. Just last year our workers were beheaded. They were killed by the Taliban for preaching the gospel. Why did they do this? There's only one reason. Jesus also suffered for us. He gave us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. These are some of the key leaders in Hunan and the church when I first met them they had 20,000 now they've grown to over 5 million people. I'm going to just take few minutes and tell you one of the great miracles that happened. It happened in the Cultural Revolution. Chairman Mao launched us in 1966 to rid the bad elements and bring in real communism. These are Christians that are being denounced by a God-hating group of people. And these people are going to have their heads cut off, are going to go to prison, are going to be beaten. These are pastors and Christians in 1967. At that time, all of the people in China only had one book. It's called The Thoughts of Chairman Mao. And I'm going to just show this to you. This is the Bible of the Chinese people. Every Chinese had to read this. All communist ideology denies that there is a God, attacks religion, attacks Jesus Christ and Christianity. One year they boasted, we printed more of this book than all of the Bibles in all the world. That was true for that year. That only for that year. They had to carry this book. That was the Bible for over one billion Chinese people at that time. They had to memorize that book. They could not have the Bible. If they had the Bible, they'd be in big trouble. Here the Bibles are being burned and they're gonna be destroyed by the Red Guards. Thousands and thousands of Christians gave their life for the word of God. This man is beating up idols. He's beating up uh, Buddhist texts and also the cross and Christianity. All religion was outlawed in China. All the pastors were sent to prison. Every church in China was closed. All they had was hand copied Bibles. I'm going to finish and just tell you the importance of the word of God and tomorrow I will be uh, continuing on this subject because it's very important. You know you can't do a lot in 45 minutes but I'm doing my very best. Praise the Lord. Okay, I want to just show you some of these things here. Uh, 
So to encourage you, when I was young, you know what we like to do? We like to smuggle Bibles. We used to go to Eastern Europe. This is the Gospel of John, the whole Gospel of John in Russian. If, if when I was young, we looked for excitement. We'd smuggle Bibles. Even now, we smuggle Bibles into North Korea. This is the whole New Testament in Korean. We do this, praise the Lord. My friend, an Australian, was arrested two years ago. We thought he'd get 15 years in labor camp, but he was only released after a few months. He said nothing at all. I'm willing to die. If I can give the Koreans the word of God. Every day people are taking this into North Korea. What are you doing to give people the word of God? Do you even give people in free nations the word of God? Let me just close in a few testimonies. When I went to China, there was no Bibles at all in China. Every single Bible had been destroyed. So they gave me some of the hand copied Bibles because I started to take Bibles. By the way, my church has taken over 12 million Bibles into China since China opened in 1978. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the help of many people. This is one of the hand copied Bibles. It was written on government paper because there was a secret believer that got paper because the communists said the church is growing so fast. Christians are everywhere. And they're copying the Bible so nobody can buy a notebook or even buy paper because if they do the copy of the Bible well you know what happened this man worked for the government and he used communist paper to study to copy the most important book for a Christian what do you think the most important is you think it's like Leviticus or numbers well and that's not very edifying you think it's the gospel no because they know the gospels they're Christians is, is there the Psalms of course they know the Psalms it's the book of Acts the book of Acts tells Tells you the gospel message how to preach the gospel by the way it tells you what to do if you get in prison two examples in the book of Acts where people got out of prison because of worship and praise another time because of the prayer of the church they love the book of Acts most of the hand copied Bibles were the book of Acts here I have another one someone's able to get a notepad and copied the book of Acts that's why they speak in tongues that's why they heal the sick that's why they raise the Dead. That's why they will suffer gladly in persecution because this is a book. And just one or two minutes, one guy said, Hey, it's not enough to have the book of Acts. I'm going to give him the whole New Testament. So he did the whole New Testament by hand. He did it by a stencil. By hand, he copied 1,000 copies. 1,000 copies went to 1,000 churches, and they made copies, and it just exploded. Nobody had the whole New Testament. But he was executed for this, a crime in China at that time. And then lastly, they gave me a book in 1988. They said, Pastor Balcom, can you reproduce this book? I'll show you a copy of the book. It has pictures in it, pictures of uh, Jesus and the disciples. It's called The Life and Teachings of Jesus. This book was published over a hundred and ten years ago and it's the only one left in the world and you see Jesus is depicted as a Chinese but it's the New Testament story and they said we preserved this book for over a hundred years when the Japanese occupied China when the communists came when the Red Guards came we dug a hole in the ground and put it there till the danger is over this is the book we've been using because it talks about Jesus and he's a Chinese so oh I said we need to give you this book but it was in a bad condition so we reproduced this book I brought some copies here if you have any Chinese friends that want to know about Jesus this is a wonderful book it's called the life and teachings in Jesus you know when you're in Chinese this is the front and this is the back and you read always from the right to the left from the top to the bottom well you know it's wonderful to bless the people with the Word of God we need the Word of God this is just the Word of God it's a Bible with pictures in it and it's in the concept of a Chinese person hallelujah I'm gonna be talking more about the Word of God tomorrow I love the Word of God I've been talking about deviant teachings and true teachings and I'll be talking about the fire of the Holy Ghost but my time is up and I want to just pray for you if you are here Let's stand all together. And you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you want to know Jesus and all of his power, just take a step and come forward. Like we did last night. Praise the Lord. You will be filled. In the other church, in Sunday morning, there were some young people that came forward. 
and at least one of them spoke in tongues. Young people can speak in tongues. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So just come forward if you want to be prayed for. Maybe you're sick in your body. You need to be healed. You know, I have seen thousands of people healed just by the word of faith, just by the prayer of faith. I've seen thousands of people baptized in the Holy Spirit. God is here. He's in this place. He wants to meet you. He wants to bless you. You know, but Jesus said, come and follow after me. So they left their nets. They got up. They followed after Jesus. And we can say, you know, we talk about the altar. We're not the tabernacle, but the altar is like the front of the church. It's where they offered the sacrifices. And God wants you to give your life as a sacrifice. So if you need to be healed, if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you need prayer just come forward and we have so many bishops and apostles and elders and men of God and women of God praise the Lord that we have a lot of faith in this building tonight and you can meet the Lord so quickly come forward and let's just pray that we'll have an open heaven pray that you will speak in another language pray that you receive gifts of the Holy Spirit pray that your body will be healthy even as I mentioned David said bless the Lord oh my soul for good and all of his benefits who healeth all of your diseases who forgiveth all of your sins who crowns your life with goodness he is a good God and he gives good things yes it's by grace this grace comes because we repented and we believed in Jesus Christ grace is not just God's favor grace is the power of God working in you to do what you cannot do in your own life so today we're gonna all receive the Holy Spirit we're gonna all begin to speak in other languages like on the day of Pentecost we're going to begin to see the miracles working in our body. Sicknesses will be healed. Hallelujah. Demonic oppression will leave. God is in this place. Let's all just lift our voices to the Lord and let us call upon his name for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Speak another language. And you that haven't, by faith open your mouth. Speak in a heavenly tongue. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just speak it out. Everybody begin to pray. Pray out loud and call upon the name of the Lord. Create an atmosphere of faith in this building. Oh Lord, fall upon your servant. Fall upon your handmaiden. Fill her, Lord, Bring healing, health, O oh Lord, deliverance. Oh, blessing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, the river of liver, living water will flow out, flow out, flow out. Receive, receive, receive. Holy Ghost, come right now, fall upon you. Oh, Rebecca, let the wind of Pentecost blow upon you. Receive, let the fire of Pentecost. Pentecost, burn in your soul. Receive. 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 Holy Ghost fire. Holy Ghost fire. Young people will speak in tongues. Children will be filled with the Holy Spirit.